Okay, so we're going to go into each of the different phyla that we're going to be talking about. The first group are the gram positives. Uh, these are the firmicutes and the actinobacteria. So we'll talk particularly about some of the kind of cell wall traits of the uh, firmicutes and some uh, important properties about the actinobacteria that are really important for human health. So this group has primarily gram-positive staining cell walls. Uh, not all of them stain gram-positive. This is because some of the bacteria in this group have actually lost their cell wall or have uh, specifically changed cell walls. Um, but they're, the majority are gram-positive staining, and they are all evolutionarily related. The two groups, we have the firmicutes, which means tough skin. Some of these also form endospores, which helps contribute to that. Uh, they have large layers of peptidoglycan um, with the tychoic acids in there, giving them their gram-positive staining. In the actinobacteria, they have a large amount of peptidoglycan, but many of them also have a thick waxy coating, as we will see. Here are some selected firmicutes. Um, we have things like Bacillus anthracis that we've talked about that causes anthrax, um, Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism toxin, Clostridium tetani, tetanus, um, some non-spore formers, Lactobacillus, uh, that's for dairy culturing, Lactococcus as well, um, Listeria, an important pathogen that we'll see, um, and Staphylococcus aureus, a common skin infection, uh, and we have methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, which is MRSA in there. And then Staphylococcus epidermidis, the other form, which is normally found on the skin of humans. So that's a non-pathogenic strain. Um, we also have some actinobacteria here, the other group. Um, Streptomyces, um, one of the many important sources of our antibiotics. Um, Cornea bacteria, diphtheriae, uh, Micrococcus luteus, we've used this in the lab. It forms those yellow colonies that we've seen. Um, Mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy, and Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes the disease uh, tuberculosis. And if you like Swiss cheese, Propionibacterium freudenreichii, sorry, my German's a little poor, but I believe that's the pronunciation. This is used in making Swiss cheese. It gives it that kind of tangy flavor that Swiss cheese has. It also causes the bubbles that are in there. So if you like Swiss cheese, you can thank that bacterium. So let's talk about the firmicutes first. Uh, in here we have rod-shaped bacteria, spherical bacteria, and several endospore formers. So remember those endospores are the heat-resistant structures that can be viable for thousands of years. We had the um, amber where we drilled out and found uh, the bacteria in the mosquito gut and were able to culture it from there. Uh, these endospores are really resistant to drying out, freezing, and even some chemical disinfectants and things like this. We've talked about the genus Bacillus before. Um, this is a major environmental uh, spore former. Uh, we have a lot of things like Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus serris that are common in the soil. Also Bacillus anthracis, which uh, oftentimes infects livestock or farmers that work with livestock. Um, this is a toxic soil microbe and it creates a toxin that uh, people can theoretically use as a bioweapon. So anthrax spores are super resistant to heat and other forms of destruction, so they make a good bioweapon that way. A related species that is possibly commercially very important is Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt, which the bacteria itself is often used as a pesticide um, because it makes a toxin that will kill uh, worms and nematodes and things that tend to uh, bore into crop roots. It is spread on the soil and it affects the worms, but it is not toxic to humans. There are some projects to take the genes for this toxin and actually add them to corn. You've probably heard of it as BT corn. Uh, controversial um, for many, many reasons, but uh, an interesting application. Instead of just using the bacteria and just spreading it willy-nilly, we could put the toxin in the corn, and then it would affect the worms that are growing in there. And you can even actually get it to specifically express in the roots, so it wouldn't even go into the fruit of the corn. 
Another genus, Clostridium, a very important. Um, we've talked about several of these before. Uh, they form the little club-shaped bacteria that make uh, the endospore on one end. Uh, we have tetanus, a common disease caused by Clostridium tetani. Um, botulism, the one we talked about uh, with the um, can of chili, C. botulinum, and a major emerging pathogen, Clostridium difficile, um, or C. diff, you've probably heard of it called. Uh, there are over 200,000 cases per year in the United States, and uh, around 13,000 plus deaths. So, a very significant hospital-acquired uh, infection, and because it makes these spores, it is very tough to get rid of once it is around. So you will remember probably that Clostridium botulinum makes a toxin that is paralytic, so it causes the nervous system to shut down. And when this gets into uh, the gut tract of infants, it can, it can cause paralysis in infants and young children, often leading to what's called floppy baby syndrome because they are literally paralyzed, so their body is very floppy. Um, this is... Uh, of concern to parents, particularly in canned goods, because uh, this can grow as an anaerobe and that spore really protects it. Or if you're interested in getting rid of your wrinkles, uh, you could inject yourself with some of this uh, Clostridium botulinum toxin, also known as Botox, and it will paralyze your facial muscles and reduce those wrinkles for you. I think that's a little bit extreme myself, but everybody's free to do whatever they want. So uh, go ahead and inject your paralytic toxins at your peril. Some other interesting firmicutes, um, non-endospore forming bacilli. Um, we have some uh, lactic acid bacteria, lactococcus and lactobacillus that that will ferment milk to make yogurt and cheese. So if you like those two things, these bacterial species are very important. Uh, Listeria is a very interesting one. Listeria is an intracellular pathogen um, that can cause uh, GI tract issues and even in the nervous system. So it actually lives inside of cells. That's what intracellular means. And it gets into the cell by phagocytosis, but it stops the process and it goes into the cell. And once it's inside the cell, it's pretty well protected. And then it can grow and it grows these long, what are called actin tails. It basically hijacks the cell uh, actin filaments to move around the cell that you can see that in this micrograph here. And it will even bud off out of one cell into another. So this protects it because it's hidden from the immune system once it gets inside of a cell. Uh, our immune cells are outside of these cells, so the bacteria, once it gets in, is hidden. And listeria is really interesting because it can grow at very low temps. Things like 4 degrees C, which is about what your refrigerator is at. So listeria bacteria is a foodborne illness many times uh, because it can grow in the refrigerator. We think we put something in the fridge and no bacteria are going to grow or they're going to grow really slow. But listeria actually can grow quite rapidly in the refrigerator couple of firmicutes to finish up with. We have some gram-positive cocci here. Enterococcus, this normally lives in your intestines, and it can cause severe infections when it moves to other parts of the body, like say you have a puncture wound or something like that. Streptococcus uh, can actually cause tooth decay. There are some forms of streptococcus that live in your mouth and they produce acids that decay your teeth. There are also forms of streptococcus that cause pneumonia disease. You've probably heard of strep throat. Um, this is one version of that disease. Staphylococcus, we've talked about. A lot of them are skin microbes. We have aureus, which can cause uh, infections in many places when it gets out of place. And we have MRSA, the methicillin-resistant form of that so one interesting thing is uh, there are all kinds of projects to characterize the microbiomes of individuals. And there are all kinds of different microbiomes in different locations in our body. We have a skin microbiome, probably your nose, your gut. Um, for women, the vaginal microbiome is of great importance to proper health. Um, 
So we have all these microbiomes and we're finding out that individuals can have different microbiomes um, and this could potentially lead to differences in health and well-being. So there are projects to sequence the microbes that are found in different locations in the body. So this one is fun. This is the belly button microbiome. And so your belly button, right, it's like this creased fold. Um, for most people, it's an innie, right? Some people have protruding belly buttons, but uh, it's kind of folds in the skin. And that can lead to a different environment than on the surface of your skin, like say on the skin around here, because it traps more moisture. It might trap more bacteria and salts and things like this. So uh, a group sequenced 500 individuals uh, belly button microbiomes and they found between all of those patients 2,000 different strains of bacteria. So there's a huge amount of diversity between our belly buttons and many of those were firmicutes and actinobacteria that were found most often in most people. Obviously, things like uh, staphylococci are very common in here because they're common skin microbes. Okay, so let's talk about the other phylum in the gram positives, the actinobacteria. Some of them are called branching bacteria. Um, they make little filaments. The actinobacteria, um, they're a pretty broad group and they include some of our most important antibiotic producers. There are decomposers in there uh, in the natural environment and also pathogens. So a lot of these are soil microbes and people actually go out and sample different soils looking for these actinobacteria. Some of their species have cell walls with very strange cell wall lipids in there, uh, like mycolic acid, as we'll see. So many of them will stain with the acid fast stain. So some of them don't really stain properly with the gram stain. You have to use a different type of stain, as we'll see. Um, the actinomycete group, this is a subgroup in there. Uh, this is our major source of antibiotics. So here's some examples of actinomycetes. They kind of look like fungi, but they're actually bacteria. Um, and so you can see these beautiful colors here. These little blue, dark blue or purple dots that are on here are actually bubbles of liquid antibiotic coming out of these cells. So these bacteria make antibiotics that will kill other bacteria that they might be competing with. So um, here's a, a zoomed in version of these bacteria here. You can see they kind of have a, a chain like construction here. There are actinobacteria that are not in that actinomycetes group. Um, many of them have cell walls with the mycolic acid like we talked about. Uh, we have some that are pathogens, and of course we have some that are symbionts. Uh, some of the common ones, uh, Gardnerella vaginellus, a common cause of bacterial vaginosis, an infection of the vagina. Uh, Corneobacterium diphtheriae causes the disease diphtheria, which is a respiratory disease. Um, Propiani bacterium, as I mentioned before, uh, this is used in producing Swiss cheese. So it makes propionic um, acid, which is um, uh, gives that tangy flavor to the Swiss cheese and also creates bubbles, which make the holes in the Swiss cheese. And then we have our mycobacterium, both tuberculosis and leprosy. So we've talked about this before. Uh, remember, they have these really thick cell walls with lots of um, mycolic acid in it. So to stain them, we use this acid fast stain, which stains kind of this purpley color. Um, and we have two common species, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes the lung infection tuberculosis, and Mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy, which is a skin disease. We talked about this in previous chapters. So Remember, these are very slow growing, difficult to culture and difficult to treat because of their thick resistant cell wall. That's why we have to use this special stain to stain them. They're resistant to the gram stain because of this. So let's look at some case history here. Uh, Michael, he's 45 years old. He goes into the see this physician because he is feeling fatigued. He's unable to sleep, has lost appetite and been coughing for several weeks. So that coughing is the worrying part. So they do a chest x-ray and it shows uh, small one to five millimeter, what are called granulomas, which are nodules of inflammation in here. So these wisps of 
inflamed tissue in both lobes of his lungs. So that indicates some sort of infection here. We're going to take a sputum sample, and a sputum sample is not just spit. It is the phlegmy material that comes up from the lungs, so the mucus and stuff like that. That's going to have the bacteria there. So there are special chambers. We'll see this later in the course where we put patients in and they can hawk up their sputum sample, and they're going to culture this. And at the end of this culturing, they diagnose him with what's called secondary tuberculosis. The secondary part means they suspect that he has had it before, but that it is stuck around and become dormant, and then it's reactivated now. Uh, the severity and the length of this infection uh, is what leads us to suspect that it is secondary tuberculosis. He's noted that he had these symptoms before, and it went away, and now it's back. Even worse, that indicates that he's had it before, and it's come back. So the tuberculosis um, is caused by that bacteria. Um, it's an intracellular pathogen, and it only infects humans, interestingly. It's transmitted through respiratory droplets, and uh, so they're going to place him in isolation and start him on some long-term uh, mix of drugs. So he has four different antibiotics that are in there. Um, they have to do this for two months, followed by four more months of just two of the drugs. So this is a very long-term treatment because the cell wall of mycobacterium is very resistant to drugs. Luckily, he responds well and is not infected with a dangerous strain like a multi-drug resistant TB, which is becoming more and more common, unfortunately. So tuberculosis is a very interesting disease. Um, we think of it kind of as being um, a bit older, something you would hear about in the 1800s or something like that. Um, and it's been documented for even longer than that. So some of our first writings about it come from Hippocrates, one of our famous uh, medical figures in ancient Greece in about 400 BCE. He noted these, uh, these nodules that form in there called tubercles, and the disease is named after those. But it's been around even longer than that. People have actually uh, taken samples from Egyptian mummies that are at least uh, from 3000 BCE, and they've sequenced the DNA in there, and they found tuberculosis DNA in there. So uh, this is a very ancient disease. It's been with us for a long, long time, and it still continues to be a problem, uh, particularly as drug-resistant forms uh, start to evolve it is also interesting. I was looking around for some information and pictures about uh, historical things about tuberculosis, and I found this one, which I thought was interesting. Posture and tuberculosis. Poor posture encourages tuberculosis, right? Erect carriage encourages this. The right posture in childhood promotes strong, healthy lungs, good circulation, sound health, and proper growth and development. Obviously, this is garbage, right? So it just goes to show that bad medical advice has been around for just as long as sound medical advice. So um, tuberculosis is not caused by poor posture. It is caused by a bacterial infection and uh, spreading through respiratory droplets. All right, that's it for the gram positives.